Okay, <laughs> we'll resume the session. So our, our third speaker is Al Tahir. He will speak about exact neural mass model for synaptic-based working memory. So the microphone is yours. Thanks a lot, uh, Roman. Thanks for the organizers for inviting me to this session. I think my talk is a bit uh, less theoretical uh, than the previous one, uh, but more uh, towards application. And the application is specifically uh, working memory. So I will start by explaining what is working memory and how the model, uh, model is able to uh, model these working memory mechanisms. Working memory, first of all, is a cognitive system. It allows us to perform uh, goal-directed behavior. So let's say we want to achieve a desired goal, and for this, we have to solve a task. This can usually require uh, information to be rapidly stored and maintained, also to be processed and to be rehearsed or to read, read out. And uh, experimentalists study working memory mechanisms uh, in so-called delayed response experiments or tasks. So basically, they train a subject, it might be animal or human, to solve a task. And uh, during the solving of this task, they perform electrophysiological measurements. So, for example, using electrodes to measure spike trains or uh, local field potentials, LFP. Or uh, with humans, for example, using electroencephalography, EEG, using this cap with the electrodes on the skull. And uh, these, these type of experiments in the last decades have led to uh, many theories. And one particular one which I'm interested in is the synaptic theory of working memory by Mongillo and colleagues. Um, and this synaptic theory of working memory, the, basis, the base uh, concept which is storing the working memory information is short-term synaptic plasticity, STP. It uh, basically consists, com comprises two effects which are known as uh, depression and facilitation. And the idea is that the uh, presentation of some working memory information like here triggers depression and facilitation and that the information is maintained and stored in the state of the synapses. And in this model, the um, working memory information is encoded in a macroscopic state. So not in the microscopic state of the single neurons, but in the macroscopic state of a population of neurons. Um, of course, if we want to study working memory, we can take a network model like here and the work of Mongilu and uh, perform the simulations and see how the working memory mechanisms work. But since uh, the information is stored in the microscopic state, it would be nice to have a microscopic model, uh, low dimensional model, so to speak. And uh, we wanted to fulfill some properties. Of course, it must be based on STP. And the second thing is it should somehow give access to measures or to some correlates of local field potentials or EEG signals. So let's go to the model. Uh, the model is consisting of a network of um, quadratic integrate and fire neurons, the QIF neurons. So we see the quadratic term and the differential equations for the membrane potential dynamics. This eta i is some constant current depending on the index, and the neurons in the network are coupled via instantaneous synapses. Uh, the synaptic current is uh, proportional to the firing rate of the population, and this j is some uh, synaptic weight. The firing rate is simply given by a superposition of all spike trains. Then we have some reset rule, and uh, overall in the network, we have n equations. Taking this type of, of network, uh, making some assumptions on the eta i, uh, we can perform a mean field limit. So sending n to infinity and also the threshold to infinity. This second uh, limit uh, helps us to, uh, to render the QIF neuron identical to a phase oscillator model, which is the so-called theta model. And in 2008, uh, Ott and Antonsen uh, published a work which allows uh, for a certain class of phase oscillator model, models an exact mean field reduction from microscopic dynamics to macroscopic dynamics, so towards a low dimensional system. And exactly this limit has been performed by Montbrio, Paso, and Roxin in 2015. Um, they described this, uh, the, the exact firing rate equations, which I also call here neural mass in this talk. They basically consist not any more of n equations, but only of two equations describing, one of them describing the mean firing rate of the population and the other one, the mean membrane potential of the population. And the interesting thing here is that this model is exact, the limit is exact. So in the limit n to infinity, this neural mass model, the collective dynamics which we get from the neural mass model is exactly the same as the one which we would get in the network. Of course, in reality, if we want to simulate the network, we will not be able to simulate infinitely many neurons. So we will have finite size fluctuations compared to the neural mass. However, this model is extremely useful and um, to apply it to working memory, we, as I mentioned before, we have to implement short-term synaptic plasticity. I will explain it briefly. 
uh, it refers to two effects which change the synaptic rate between neurons in time. Um, these two variables, X and U, they account for two uh, effects known as uh, short-term synaptic depression, which is a weakening of the synapse. So for example, if we see um, firing rate time trace here, uh, the population is firing, the uh, coefficient X goes down and it recovers on some time scale of, uh, in this case, 200 milliseconds. Facilitation is the opposed effect. It's a strengthening of the synapses. So neurons fire, U goes up, and then it decays, but it decays on a longer time scale, at least in the prefrontal cortex. Um, probably you're a bit surprised by, by this type of STP. Usually we would want to have uh, depression and facilitation to be driven by individual neuron spike trains instead of the firing rate of the population. But this comes, of course, with many problems in performing the mean field limit. And in fact, for the application towards working memory, we don't need it, as I will show you. So we stick with this STP model implemented already on population level. These are the two systems, the network and the neural mass, and we can straightforwardly add the two STP equations to the network and the neural mass. And the limit remains exact. So in the network, we have n plus two equations, and in the neural mass, we have four equations, and you see that the synaptic weight here is multiplied by these two coefficients, x and u. To exemplify a bit the exactness, um, these are sim network simulations results, first of all, just a network, using a single excited rate population. We see here a spike scatter plot of a subset of 2,000 neurons. Uh, this is some stimulation current injected into the population, these two rectangles. This is a firing rate resulting from the network, and these two variables are depression and facilitation. Uh, the two cases, they are just uh, using slightly different parameters here. After the two pulses, the system goes back to equilibrium, and here uh, it lands on a limit cycle. Uh, the external current here applied to the population, it triggers a series of population bursts. We, you see it also in the firing rate. And um, if, we, uh, if we look at working memory, this these series of population bursts is very important for the encoding of the working memory information. But before I get there, I would like to show you how the neural mass performs. So only using four equations. And this is these Docker curves, which we see here. And we see the perfect agreement on the left side with all the dynamic variables calculated from the network and the neural mass. On the right-hand side, we see some um, differences here. This is due to finite size fluctuations because simulating the QIF network can be quite tedious and tricky. I would like to talk a bit more about these, uh, the series of these bursts. Uh, we studied this in a different project. I will not talk about it too much. Uh, we studied how these type of bursts emerge in these next generation neural mass models. And we uh, studied it using a slow fast approach. So techniques, techniques from uh, singular perturbation theory. We find very peculiar behavior, which is related to the additional time scales, which we include due to plasticity. Um, exactly. And um, so far, this was a single excitatory population. That's not enough to study working memory. So we will go towards a more complicated architecture uh, network architecture, which is still minimalistic. Um, the basic idea is that if we want to encode working memory items, we take one excitatory population to encode one working memory item. So in this case, we have two excitatory populations, blue and orange, and they, oops, they code for each one of them codes for exactly one item. They are both coupled to a common inhibitory pool. We have recurrent connections of all populations, and only the excitatory to excitatory synapses exhibit STP. Uh, IB is some background current common to all neurons, uh, to, pop, to, to all populations. Uh, it's basically a control parameter putting us in different regimes for the mechanisms of working memory. Uh, IS um, is the external current which we can use to stimulate the excitatory population, so to speak, to load working memory information into the population. And how this works, I can show you in the next slide. Uh, so this is at the background current of 1.2. We see the scatter plot of the blue population and of the orange population. We see the currents applied to the blue and orange population. This kick here to the blue population corresponds to applying a stimulation into the network, into the blue population. And this corresponds to loading the information. And why that is, I will show you. Um, the, this first rectangle pulse is targeted. It's targeted only at the blue one. So orange receives nothing, while the second one, it can be seen as a, some sort of unspecific readout signal. It is applied to both populations, but only the blue one emits one of these synchronized bursts. We can calculate the firing rate uh, using the network simulation, and we can also look at the facilita uh, depression and facilitation variables. What happens is basically that this rectangle pulse um, 
induces depression and facilitation. The um, information remains stored in the facilitated synapses, but only for the blue population, since it's the only one where we loaded the item. So when we apply the second current, only the blue one has uh, facilitated synapses and emits this population burst. The second case, um, uh, uh, by the way, again, you see here uh, the darker curve and the uh, shaded curve. Uh, these are network versus um, mean field results, and we see, again, the perfect agreement. Um, the second, uh, on the second column, we see a different uh, set of working points. So the background current is 1.5. Uh, we, again, apply a rectangle current to the blue population, but that's all the current we apply. And what happens is that the blue population starts emitting these bursts, these population bursts in a periodic manner. So it's on a limit cycle. Here, we reduce the background current and it goes back to its initial state. I will focus a bit more on the right-hand side here because this is the type of working memory suggested by um, Mongilo. Um, it is based on these population bursts. So every time um, there's a burst, facilitation and depression are refreshed. And then after some time, spontaneously, another burst emerges and this continues forever. Okay, um, so th this has been already done by Mongilo and other people using network models, but in this case, we have an exact limit. So we can use numerical bifurcation analysis to study how these different working memory states emerge. I will not go into the details, but at the basis is basically multi-stability between different states, between equilibria, between limit cycles, these green ones, for example, which emerge at this hop bifurcation. So far, we have seen good agreement between network and neural mass. And the dynamics regimes become clear via the bifurcation diagram. But we can do much more with this mean field model. Um, and I will focus on this case to show you what I mean. Um, let's talk about the importance of the average membrane potential, VK. You see the time trace here for the simulation, which I have just shown on the right-hand side. What is VK? Well, uh, the, the network model is is deterministic, there's no stochasticity. So in the end to infinity limit, we don't have any microscopic fluctuations remaining. So if we see oscillations in the voltage signal, mean voltage signal, they must be of collective nature. The voltage is nothing else than an electric field potential. So these oscillations can be seen as wave, waves of the electric field potential. And therefore they are easily comparable to EEG and LFP signals. So let's take some experiments of working memory where we see such signals. The first one I want to talk about is uh, about uh, LFP measurements in the prefrontal cortex of monkeys during working memory tasks. So basically uh, the monkeys are trained to recognize certain, certain pictures on a screen. And after the training, the, the experimentalists measure uh, the LFP. Here we see the firing, uh, the, the spike rate during the presentation of one object, it goes up here during a second object, it goes up. But what is more interesting is the spectrogram. So this is basically showing the intensity, the intensity of signals in different frequency bands as a function of time. There are two characteristics here. Every time an object is presented, we have um, a signal in the so-called delta band and around two to four hertz. And also we have this sustained activity in the beta band around 32 hertz. Now we can take this voltage signal of our mean field model, of our very simple mean field model and calculate the same type of spectrogram. And what we see, is a quite remarkable uh, re resemblance of the experiment. So we present a stimulation, we have the delta band signal, and again, we have this um, sustained uh, beta band uh, signal. Uh, we can do a bit more than in the experiment because we can calculate the spectrogram separately for the excitatory population for the inhibitory population. And we can see that the delta band is empty in the inhibitory population. So we can claim that the delta signal here or here is due to the activity of the uh, excitatory population and in particular, these population bursts. The second experiment is uh, with humans using EEG measurements. Uh, the type of experiment they perform is uh, they use vibrotactile stimulation on the fingertip. So they put a device on the fingertip, which is able to produce different frequencies and the subject can distinguish between different frequencies. So they can know if it's lower or, or high, higher frequency. The different frequencies basically correspond to different working memory information. So you see here a base frequency F1, a base frequency F2. And again, we see the spectrogram. During the first stimulation, we have this delta response. We have this very broad band response, like also in the simulation. And then we have the sustained beta band activity, like in the simulation. Um, we were wondering if this, model, this new model is advantageous compared to other established models. The, one of the most established and widely used rate models is the wilson cowan model. It's of heuristic nature and it only describes the uh, firing rate of, of neural ensembles. Um, 
and also, of course, uh, additional synaptic variables if you want to implement it. This phi is an input output for, uh, relation. So depending on, uh, on the input, we get some influence on the firing rate. And in 2017 and 18, there were two works which have chosen this phi to be in such a way that the state space structure is maintained compared to the, uh, to the model which I'm speaking about today. So we can use a wilson cowan type model, but maintaining the same bifurcation structure. This helps us to make a direct comparison of the new model versus the wilson cowan model in the same numerical experiment setup. So in this one, by loading one item into the blue population. We can use this wilson cowan model and perform the simulation. We see qualitatively similar behavior. So during the stimulation, the fire rate goes up and afterwards we have this type of uh, population burst. So the, in fact, the item is loaded and it's quite comparable. But what is missing are these tiny oscillations uh, on the population bursts. And if we calculate the spectrogram, we see exactly an empty beta band. Not like here where we have these uh, sustained activity. But if you remember this beta band, it was quite essential in the experiments. So uh, the wilson cowan model is not able to reproduce this. Um, due to the lack and detail of modeling spike synchrony. Okay, um, this was all about loading one item in the network, but as, if you remember uh, the architecture which I've showed you is able to load two working memory items. And this is what I do here. So here the blue population is stimulated. It lands on this uh, limit cycle, which where it periodically emits these population bursts. And at a later time, the orange item is loaded by another kick of same size and amplitude. And then what happens is a bit interesting. Um, the blue uh, population remains on its limit cycle, but also the orange one enters the limit cycle and they continue to emit the, these population bursts in an anti-phase manner. So, duck, duck, duck. This is, uh, I think, known as memory juggling. And these are network simulations and neural mass simulations, but the network simulations are quite tedious. We can use the neural mass to investigate it in a systematic manner. Uh, we have done this, I will just exemplify what we did. We use different amplitudes and uh, durations of the second pulse, of the second stimulation pulse, and uh, try to find out which item remains in memory. In this case, where the uh, orange pulse is very short, it is not able to load the orange item into working memory, while the blue item just remains untouched. In the second case, it corresponds to what you see on the right. Both items land into uh, on this memory juggling state. And the third case, the second stimulation is too long. It perturbs the memory state of the blue population. It basically stops emitting the bursts, but the orange one remains. Okay. Um, we can go towards more elaborate network architectures. In fact, we have um, built a network which is able to, to uh, hold seven working memory items. A similar uh, work has been done in 2017 using a wilson cowan model. Um, I, I show you how it works. So we basically have seven excitatory populations in the network, each one coding for one working memory item. And we stimulate these populations with a series of, uh, of stimulation currents. First of all, we stimulate the blue one, then the orange one, and then the green one in this case. And every time we stimulate one, they land on this cycle where they emit periodically these population bursts. Here, blue and orange, here, blue, orange, green. We can represent this in a bit easier manner by uh, making a scatter plot of the bursts, of the population bursts. So we put every time there's a population burst like here, a dot on a line, and this is the, the population index here. So we see here the cycle consisting of blue, orange, and green. This means all these three items are in memory after stimulating them. We can go beyond what we can do with the wilson cowan model, as I have shown previously, looking at the spectrogram. In fact, we can now characterize the neural oscillations during the working memory maintenance here. This is a spectrogram resulting from these, uh, uh, these simulations. It's a bit complicated, but if we have a closer look, we can understand it. First of all, uh, as in the experiments, we have this delta band response every time we load an item. So that's nice. Then we have strange lines here. Um, apparently there are um, um, multiples of some base frequency. And this base frequency is related to the longest period in, uh, in these memory cycles. So basically the period between uh, population bursts of a blue and again a blue. So this time between these two. And we see all harmonics of these. These are these lines. But some of the lines are more, more intense. And this is due to the fact that we have additional time scales. For example, the time between uh, bursts of different populations and these lines are in resonance. So the base frequency of cycle is in resonance with the burst frequency. 
and this way the uh, this res this band becomes much more intense. Additionally, uh, as a last last point, uh, remember we had uh, sustained activity in the in the beta band around 32 hertz, and it happens to be that this exactly hits one of the multiples of of the F cycle and F burst. So this is the most intense line here. We can go on with this and try to load more than three items, like here, six items. So blue is loaded, it ends, lands on the cycle, then uh, orange, green, uh, red, purple. And in this state, we have all five items in working memory. And then when we load the sixth item, it also lands in the cycle, but then uh, working memory item five is lost. So what we see here is basically a capacity limit of this network. We cannot go beyond some certain number of items. And to figure out in a bit more precise uh, what this limit is, to study it systematically, uh, we can use this neural mass model and um, check how many items remain in memory after some time when using different uh, presentation rates. So using shorter or longer times between these item presentations. And this is what you see here. So we have presentation rates from one to 80 Hertz. Uh, the orange dots correspond to slow presentation until up to nine Hertz, I think, uh, yes the blue one to fast presentation. And um, we see here the number of items which remain, remain in the memory. And we see the maximum is five. We can also see which serial positions are more likely to be retrieved, depending on how fast we, we present the items into the network. And what we see is a very well-known uh, primacy and recency effect. So if we present the information very slowly, the first items are forgotten because it's a long time ago that the network saw this information, but the, the latest one are very probable to be retrieved. And for a very fast presentation, we rather remember the first items to be presented and also the last item. This is a primacy and recency effect. Um, the similar, uh, similar work has been done using the wilson cowan model. Um, they also have found an anal analytical estimate for the capacity and we did an analogous approach. Uh, we came up with this expression for a maximum working memory capacity. And if we put on the good values, uh, we obtain four to five items, which is in good agreement with recent experimental results as well as with, I think, uh, our every, everyday life experience. The last thing I want to talk about is um, a work from 2004 um, where experimentalists have found a predictor for the maximum working memory capacity in the following way. We see here time traces of some, some voltage uh, membrane potential difference or local field potential difference. Um, it's experiments with humans, as far as I remember. And um, the subjects see arrays on a screen which show different number of items. So the blue trajectory here shows uh, the voltage trace when two, two items are presented, the green when four items are presented and the red when six. What we see, when two are presented, uh, the curve is quite low. When four are presented, it's higher. But, but, but when six are presented, it does not go further. And this is due to uh, the uh, memory capacity limit to be reached, which is around five. So we see saturation of these potential difference when um, the capacity is reached. And if we go beyond six, so here eight and 10 are additionally shown, uh, we, we don't not only have saturation, but the potential difference decreases even. And we tried to find a different, a similar measure using our neural mass model, which is this delta V here. And uh, we can do the same type of experiment by showing different number of items to the network in the simulation. The blue curve corresponds to one item shown. The orange curve corresponds to two items shown and three, four, five. And we see a similar increase as here as the more items we present. The bottom panel corresponds to the bottom panel here. So we show two items, four items, six items, uh, five items and six items where we get the first saturation and then seven items where we get the decrease. So somehow uh, we can find a similar uh, predictor for the working memory capacity as in the experiments of 2004. Um, this was the last experiment I wanted to talk about and uh, with this I can uh, conclude. Um, of course, many of the results which I have shown have been already obtained using um, using microscopic networks, leaky integrated and fire networks and, and, and with synaptic plasticity. Uh, but the good thing here is uh, that the model is exact and is still able to reproduce the working memory mechanisms when we implement STP. It is low dimensional, so it's very easy to study. We can make systematic scans. We can make um, bifurcation analysis. We can do a bit of analysis. As you have seen, uh, we could estimate the working memory capacity. Um, 
A very important aspect is the better agreement is with experimental results because we have seen that this beta band activity is absent using Wilson Cowan type models. But here, uh, since the uh, Montbrio puzzle and Roxy model captures spike synchrony, we are able to reproduce those. And finally, all these uh, advantages are based on the fact that it, this limit is exact. Uh, and with this, I thank you for your attention. Uh, this is uh, the publication where these results are from, and I'm happy to take your questions. Okay, thank you very much, Al Gould. Um, let's see uh, if somebody raises his hand. Oh, yes. So we have two questions, one by Etienne, one by Quentin. Uh, I'll start by uh, uh, Quentin. Okay. Um... I have a question concerning um, the, the model. Um, when, uh, there, when you consider a finite number of neurons, uh, I was wondering what is random and what is uh, not in the model. Um, there's no randomness in this model. So maybe the initial condition is picking at random? No, no. no? Uh, it's, we start in the fixed points. I mean, we, we start the simulation, we let the transient pass and we end up in a fixed point. And this is the starting point of these numerical simulations. Okay. Um, what can be random is uh, the distribution of the eta i currents, um, the constant components of the currents applied to the neurons. Um, in this case, they are Lorentzian distributed, but not random. There's a deterministic way of distributing those um, Lorentzian. I see. Thank you. Pleasure. Um, then we have somebody called G Palm. Can you? Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. Um, yes, I just have a question um, to the beginning when you when you um, put your model together. Mm -hmm. And I think it was transparency number six. I will share my screen and we see. Yes. Um, I was wondering, I mean, so when you introduce your neural mass idea, mm -hmm. you go from, you start with n plus two equations. Yes. And maybe you said something about it. Why n plus two? Why uh -huh. not n plus n squared or something like this? Why not three n? Okay. Um, no, no. Why not even more? Right? You have. Ah, I see. Okay. Uh, the the um, I can uh, I can explain it a bit. This type of uh, of synaptic dynamics is called presynaptic depression and facilitation in this case. Mm -hmm. So the the reason why these X and U reduce and increase are uh, depending on the neural, ne the state of the neuron itself, depending on calcium levels in the synaptic terminals. And this is identical for all synaptic terminals. Yeah, I'm not sure why? Uh, so, I mean, in, in reality, it would not be identical to all synaptic terminals. Well, uh, this is, okay, I can tell you this is a, the, uh, this is a Zodix Pavlicic Macra model. They assume that it is identical. Of course, it would be neat to have n squared to have one equation for each synapse, but I think uh, this type of mean field limit will be very difficult to obtain. But it could be that even in that case, mm -hmm. if you go to the limit, it could still become four equations. If we what? Well, if you, if you don't start with this kind of limit behavior already yes. concerning the synaptic depression and facilitation. And so you start with more equations. It could be that you go, when you go to the limit with the activity, you also yeah. come to a limit with the depression and facil facilitation and you end up with four equations again. It is. But maybe with slightly different ones. It is possible, but I think there is a bit more behind. I okay. I can show you. Um, I can show you the case where we have um, three n equations, not n square. 
for the synapses. So each neuron has two synaptic equations that instead of the whole population. Hmm. In this case, I, 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 we were not able to, to, to obtain an exact limit. I know that other people are working on it, um, on approximations of this um, mean field limit. I, th I think Tilo Schweiger will be talking a bit about this on the session on Wednesday. And they use some approximation and they end up with more than four equations. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I think if, without the approximations, if there is a way to obtain a limit an exact way, I think uh, it will be more complicated than four. This is my feeling. Okay. But I cannot tell you for sure. <laughs> Thank you. Pleasure. Okay. Thank you, Elgur. I'm afraid that this is the last question. Uh, okay.